So I'm going to interrupt your conversation, but not your eating. Um, continue, please. I'm uh, Susan Barbieri Montgomery, and along with my colleagues, Gloria and Tucker, I'm one of the coordinators of this program. This is the fourth time we've had an IP innovation connection. I see familiar faces, and wonderfully, I see a lot of new faces. This year, we've brought the IP innovation connection together with um, a conference that IGM has always sponsored, and we've kind of joined forces here. And that's brought new people into the audience and um, new thinking in into some of how we've approached the program. And that's kind of, so that's innovative for us. That's kind of fun for us. Um, and what, one of the things that we've kept is this um, diversity, a variety. I liked that word. Someone said we use the word variety. And I think that's good, because sometimes diversity now has a whole politically laden meaning. Um, and, uh, and in academia, we talk about interdisciplinarity or just interdiscipline is enough without adding um, any more tales to it. And so that's one of the things that we've really kept and we love about this program is that people come from so many different specialties. There are people in this room that have such deep exper experience and expertise in a particular area sitting side by side with someone who has equally um, deep and long experience and great insights, but in a completely different area. And you get to hear each other and have the, what I think of as a kind of nice intellectual luxury I enjoy of listening to someone who really knows something that I don't know anything about but can share with me in a way that I can gain an insight from it and take back to what I, what I am doing. And as we say, by the end of the day, we end up here with mostly questions, lots of questions, good questions, but maybe not always answers. Um, and in the spirit of that, and continuing that, I'm um, going to introduce to you um, Dean Jeremy Paul, who's the dean of the law school here. The law school is one of the co-sponsors of this program, um, which is another sign of um, the interdisciplinarity here. And um, I'll tell you that uh, Dean Paul has um, been with us now for three years. So in law school parliaments, we call him a 3L. 1L, 2L, 3L, that's what the students call themselves. So he's a, he's a 3L. And he arrived at our law school, um, which is a non-traditional law school, at a time of immense disruption in the legal industry, so much so that it's on the cover of the New York Times enough that you've all probably read a little bit about it, um, and also within um, legal education. And so he's had that, um, he, and he's, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting role to have, to arrive at a new place with a tradition and a unique identity at a time when your whole field is being disrupted. And I will tell you that, you know, I'm, I'm, we're all immensely pleased and impressed with what he's doing, and I feel like he's just at the point where, you know, the, the first part's over, next part's coming, um, and so you get to meet him. I don't know if he'll give us any signals of what that might be. But he is, has certainly been, in the time he's been here, um, a great proponent um, and cheerleader for interdisciplinary activities um, um, for our students and um, between the different colleges for faculty and between the school and the communities that we serve. And so in, for that reason, if no other, I'm glad he's here to give you some remarks. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Susan, for that uh, introduction, and uh, Gloria and Tucker for uh, uh, all three of you jointly sponsoring this wonderful conference. We are delighted to be uh, co-sponsoring this event uh, and to cooperate with the uh, DeMore McKim uh, School of Business. Uh, what uh, Susan said about interdisciplinarity, uh, the way I look at it at the law school is uh, every law school can teach its students uh, how to speak the language of the law. Uh, but you're not likely to be a very successful attorney uh, if you can't also speak the language of your clients. Uh, and one of the things that's great about this conference is it introduces a whole new uh, vocabulary, uh, which a lot of people who study law don't know about, uh, and they should because it's very interesting and, and cutting edge, and I'm very pleased to uh, be here. Uh, you know, when I tell people stories about their effect of design uh, on economic development, uh, my starting point always is my trip to uh, Barcelona, uh, where if you go there, um, I highly recommend it. It's so beautiful. 
There's no industrialist or inventor ever who's done more for a city uh, than Gaudi did uh, for Barcelona. And so the idea that there's a separation between design uh, and economic growth uh, has never made much uh, sense to me. Uh, but of course, since I'm the dean of the law school, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about law. Uh, and the, the, you know, from, from my perspective, um, the original designers uh, of our country uh, were lawyers, right? They were the people who wrote the Constitution. Uh, and there's no more fundamental design document about how we all choose uh, to live uh, than uh, the Constitution, which sets out the structure uh, that governs things. And one of the things I think that gets too often lost in talking about what it is that lawyers do today uh, is uh, so much time is spent uh, talking about litigation and fighting uh, over who gets how much of the pie, uh, and far too little uh, time is spent talking about how can we design things uh, in such a way that it's uh, better for everyone. Uh, the phrase I like to use that's consistent with uh, our law school's uh, social justice and public interest mission uh, is that we want to weave the fabric of justice into everyday life. Uh, think how much better it is uh, to have uh, a car uh, in which the seat belts, you know, sort of are easy to put on uh, rather than when they're hard to put on, uh, rather than just passing a law that says you have to wear your seat belt. Uh, there's a million examples uh, that are like that. Um, well, I remember once I stood on the podium at uh, uh, graduation uh, and I was trying to get people to go where the camera was going to be so their photo could be taken. Uh, and for you know the first hour, I'm saying, stand over there, stand over there. Nobody gets it. Everyone's all over. And finally, I just stopped talking. And every time then, I would go like this, right? And they would all just go right there because they visual cues uh, were better for them uh, than verbal cues. And lawyers have trouble with that. Uh, we're so big on uh, spending so much time thinking about uh, what the rules ought to be uh, that we don't spend enough time figuring out now that we've figured out what they ought to be, how can we actually get people to follow them? Uh, and one of the things that's happening to our profession, which I actually think is exciting, although I, I know that a lot of my colleagues don't agree, uh, is that uh, in large organizations, uh, what used to be the preeminent job, the law job, was the person who figured out, read the regulations, and figure out this is where you ought to, how we can comply with them. Uh, but then that's it. They figure out what the regulations are and what they mean, and they stop. Uh, and now uh, large companies are building, you know, departments that are even larger than the legal department to actually figure out what can we do to design the way our business is done uh, so that um, it's likely that the people who are working here understand what the rules are and can actually comply with what it is that the lawyers figured out it was that they're supposed to do. Uh, and you know, some people, some of my colleagues think that's not really a law job and I'm like, what do you mean that's not a law job? How could it not be a, a, a law job when it's actually about uh, figuring out uh, what it is uh, that we want? how to get people to comply with actually what the, what the rules are. Uh, so one of the things that we've done at our law school to try and sh shake things up a little bit uh, is we created an innovation lab. It's called New Law Lab. And the goal of the lab is to figure out how can law be reimagined uh, in light of the kinds of design thinking and working that uh, all of you were talking about uh, at the morning panels. Uh, and several projects are already underway. Uh, one I think is particularly exciting is that they are working on uh, a computer application or a mobile phone application for people who can't afford lawyers uh, and who have to go appear in front of a judge or go to a regulatory agency. Uh, how can they navigate? And this actually will guide them step by step uh, through the process. Uh, you know, it might put some lawyers out of business uh, because, you know, you have a computer to tell you what to do. Uh, but in the end, it will be better for the clients. And I guess to the extent that I hear a message uh, from design thinking is you want to start with the customer and for us the customer is in fact uh, the, the client. Uh, another thing that they've been working on is trying to figure out how to make sure uh, that people who are given rights uh, by uh, a legal system uh, actually find out about them because it doesn't do any good to have any rights if you don't know what they are. Uh, so they've been working with, a, with something called a nanny van uh, to travel around from neighborhood to neighborhood and explain to people who are uh, domestic uh, workers uh, what, their, uh, what their rights are. Uh, they're also working with a uh, private sector uh, company uh, that um, has not been able to figure out where all their documents are. Right? So they have millions and millions of documents, and then when they get audited, they don't know how to find them. Right? Uh, so they're, they're coming up with, I, I say to them, it's like the uh, Dewey classification system uh, for contracts uh, so that they can actually you know, do a database search and figure out uh, how this works. 
Uh, but the theme in, in all cases is the same. Uh, it's that the goal of the legal system uh, is not simply to issue edicts uh, that tell people, here's what you should do and here's what you shouldn't, uh, but actually to design systems uh, and institutions uh, so that the values that are implicit in the legal system are actually carried out. Uh, and so one of the goals that we have uh, at uh, Northeastern's Law School is to incorporate more and more of those things uh, into our teaching, uh, including how to present evidence in different ways, visual cues and things such as that, uh, so that the um, lawyers will be trained for the what, what you might call a client-centered world uh, as opposed to a lawyer-centered world. It's a little bit of a shock, but uh, I think it will make, make us a better place. So in any event, thank you all very much for being here. I'm happy to be able to have a chance to join you, and I look forward to it. Great day for the rest of the day. Thanks very much. Uh, well, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lee Moreau, who's a principal at Continuum. Uh, Lee started off his uh, career as an architect and has turned uh, into strategy and uh, really leading empathetic design in a wide range of areas and complex systems to spaces, working with clients like Procter & Gamble and Staples, among others. Uh, and uh, we're very happy that uh, Continuum and Lee agreed to do this today. And we're very, I'm personally, I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing the story of how Continuum has transformed over the last 30 years uh, to where they are today and the, the very good work they do with a number of variety of different clients in many different industries. So, Lee, welcome. Working. <laughs> okay, so. All right. I feel bad for you guys. Well, the tech. So I, you know, after this morning, the conversations about failing fast, um, innovation center versus implementation center. What is the role of those things? Uh, the fidelity of prototyping. These are all conversations that I love to hear and I hope to engage in as the afternoon goes on. And. I'd like this to be as conversational as possible. I'm up on stage. I'll be talking at you for the most part. But I'd love it if you just raise your hand. If you want clarification on something, just be open and flexible. Um, so thank you, Tucker, for helping to arrange this and inviting me and uh, inviting me on behalf of Continuum. Um, it's a, been a 30-year journey for Continuum. I've been there for five years. Um, and so that I just want to put that into context so that you understand where I'm coming from and my relationship to the company. So um, I'm calling this an, an evolution of innovation, which is a really ambitious title. Um, but what I'm trying, what I'll show you through this conversation is really where I think um, the product innovation world has developed over the last 30 years, where I think it's going, and then I'll leave you with uh, a provocation in the form of a project that I think articulates where a new opportunity area is for the industry. So that's where I think this evolution of innovation will take us. Um, this is where I started. I'm, as, I was trained as an architect. I did everything from big foggy room events. This is basically a party in New York. Uh, to ex ex exhibition design. This is exhibitry for a show in Milan, uh, in Torino in 2009. Uh, it was called You Prison. I also did um, brand strategy work. This is for the Harvard University Art Museums. Harvard University Art Museums. I did this work with 2x4 in New York about half a dozen years ago, really complex ecosystem of artifacts. You have two physical museums. You have three named museums. You have lots of study centers. All this is kind of being reformed in real time and will open, I think, in a month or so um, as the new Harvard Art Museum. And so we did a rebrand. And you can imagine the complexity of dealing with all those constituents at Harvard in all those institutions with big titles and how you bring all that stuff together. I think the, the most important aspect of this is understanding that they had one of the top 10 collections in the world. Um, and yet there are people in Boston who've actually never gone to what was formerly known as colloquially the, the Fogg Museum. So really trying to reframe this institution both for an internal audience and also for an external audience. So um, events, exhibitry, brand strategy, this is sort of where it started to come together. Again, this is with two by four. Before I got to Continuum, this is an exhibit in Beijing before the 2008 Olympics called the Nike 100. So this is um, what, was what we described it as 100 artifacts in the battle against drag from the Nike archive. Um, Nike has a great, in Beaverton, Oregon, they have this amazing facility where they have all these old you know, pieces from the past. Um, 
and, but in a way it wasn't ever curated. So we were trying to reframe that legacy um, and that kind of history of sport, if you will, for the Chinese audience who really doesn't fully appreciate the Nike mythology that they'd created. So again, these are 100 artifacts. Some are video artifacts, some are actual physical things, some are physical artifacts that we recreated for the exhibit, which is also interesting in terms of the creation of the mythology of Nike. This is the exterior. We had to obscure the Olympic athletes. You couldn't actually know who these guys were. Um, but you can see the entrance here. And this is where it all came together for me. This is the opening, the day where I realized, so I'm standing behind Katie and Michael here taking this photograph, and I realized they'd spent as much money flying in all the bloggers, thought leaders, sneaker freakers from all over the world as, it, as they spent on the actual investment in the exhibit, all of our design time, everything. They basically, you know, first class tickets from all over the world. And what I realized is this is the mythology playing out right in front of my face, the creation of mythology and that telling of story. Um, and so mythology is, has long filled this gap in the Nike's product ecosystem. I mean, nobody ever thinks that there's a product ecosystem problem for Nike, that they've got everything figured out. But frankly, they just built shoes for a really long time. But they created this incredible myth around, and now some of it's founded in reality. You've got Michael Jordan, clearly amazing athlete. But the mythology of Michael Jordan is so much bigger than Michael Jordan, right? So, and, and so it's the, the elite athletes that they bring in. It's the story about um, Bill Bowerman with a waffle iron and how performance was created through innovation of actual materials and things like that. That's the construction of mythology. It's really important. What they've done successfully now is they've replaced that mythology with actual lived experience. So now you've got human beings out there actually becoming the elite athletes. So you don't have to have Michael Jordan on a pedestal anymore. You have my friends going to Facebook saying, I did a four mile run today, check it out. So this whole Nike plus ecosystem and everything else that they've done has really supplanted the need for mythology. I mean, yes, they still have Michael Jordan. They just paid, I don't know how much they spent to, get, to keep Kevin Durant on the payroll, right? It's just a few weeks ago. But it's important to realize that their customer ecosystem is so much richer. And I think the, what I'm articulating here in the transition over, I think their 30 to 40 year history from being simply a product company into a company that can create and deliver an overall brand experience, something that's completely immersive, um, is illustrative of what's happening to our industry in the innovation space. So I'll keep coming back to this, but just to kind of situate this conversation a little bit, keep this model in your mind, because this is amazing what they both, you know, you have to appreciate what Nike was able to do both from the perspective of creating that mythology. Very few companies um, can drink their own Kool-Aid and believe it in such a convincing way that makes you want to be part of it, right? I mean, that's really a powerful thing. But then they also were smart enough to actually replace that mythology creation with real lived experience of their consumers. So Continuum, it's a design, if for those of you who don't know, um, a design and innovation uh, consultancy. We are based, we're based in West Newton, Massachusetts. We are founded here, we have five offices, but our, I think the most important thing that we do is we, we do design and we help companies understand what's next, but most importantly what we do is we partner with our clients. So in addition to listening to consumers, which is a sort of baseline for um, uh, innovation consulting uh, and, and, and design thinking, we partner with our clients to deeply understand what it is about them that makes them different from every other company, from all their competitors, um, and it's through that partnership and our engagement with our consumers that we can create new things for that company. So we get, we like to say we get local around the world. We have five offices. Um, we're based in, as I said, in Boston, but we're in Seoul, Shanghai, Milan, and Los Angeles. And, and this gives us a global footprint, which is valuable both in terms of resourcing, resourcing projects and delivering service to clients, but also in going out and doing research. So we have local speakers and a lot of different geographies that matters to some of our global, our global clients like Procter & Gamble, for example. So we can go to China and various parts of China and actually speak the native language and talk to consumers at their level, which is really important. I've done a lot of this work. I don't speak Spanish. I've done a lot of work for a major Spanish bank. And working through interpreters can be done. Uh, and, and you can really understand what consumers are, are trying to get out of, a, out of an experience through an interpreter, but it is not the same. Um, and my colleagues who, who have seen both sides and have native uh, language skills in other geographies have told me this. So it's important that you be local. 
Um, we don't do research, we learn, and we like to really stress this. So we call it research when we're, we're writing on a contract, but for us, it's really about learning. It's going and really deeply understanding what consumers are looking for. So the example we have here is for um, uh, a toothpaste manufacturer, and we were trying to understand, and if you think about some of the things that have changed in the toothpaste world in the last decade or so, there's sparkliness, there's effervescence. You've all bought these products. You know what, what's happening, right? There's like granules and things. Like, we're trying to understand mouthfeel. That was a really important thing that this uh, manufacturer was trying to understand. What is it about mouthfeel, that taste in your mouth, that the effect of toothpaste in your mouth that matters? So we kind of did a segmentation very responsibly. We want to talk to some single people and some couples and some parents. But we also wanted to talk to the extremes. Like, so the guy with grills, or the teens with braces, the sort of extreme users who have a very different or acute understanding of what mouthfeel is. And then we also want to talk to experts. So um, we talk to a mouth model who spends a lot of time understanding the kind of aesthetics of her mouth in this case, and how that was you know, represented to the rest of the world. We talk to dentists. We also talk to a porn star about mouthfeel, people who had acute and specific and a deeper appreciation I mean, you, we don't always talk to porn stars in our research, in our learning. It, it varies from project to project. But here it mattered because this is someone who deeply understands the challenges that we face and could articulate um, the role of mouthfeel in a kind of in an oral hygiene experience very differently than someone else. Um, and the same, a lot of giggling over here. Same thing is true uh, from a, a, as a, a sommelier, for example, who understands the taste in their mouth how flavor moves around and that sense of mouthfeel. So really understanding deeply what, what consumers are looking for, how they understand, um, and how they engage with products is important. Um, and our people are obsessed with solving problems. So we have a lot of these tinkerer types on our staff who just can't stop until they figure it out. And so we get into the backs of consumer experiences. We're often in the back of house, as you can see Heather there in the back, that's with a, a farmer project. Um, our project, you see some research over there, making cleaning easier. Um, that's some of the work that we did for Swiffer. I'll reference that in a second. But you know, you, when you go into people's homes and you see the problems that they're dealing with every day, you just frankly can't help but try to solve those problems. Like, how do we make this easier for you? Because when you go into someone's house, um, the, the example of the Swiffer project, and you ask them, uh, please don't clean your floor. We're going to come in. We're going to watch you clean your floor. And when you realize that when you get there, they've already cleaned their floor because they were too embarrassed to actually have you come in to a, a dirty house. Um, and then you watch them change their clothes, right, before they, before they start to clean the floor. You've got to make that, pro that problem better. You, you've got to solve this for people. So we're really obsessed with solving problems, and we take a very sort of um, uh, empathic but also scientific approach to doing that. And we think that each project makes us smarter. And, we have a really diverse set. We have 32, just in the, the uh, West Newton studio of the 140 employees, we have 32 different technical disciplines that are represented. So that, that, well, that's a challenge because it means you often have to be really excellent at what you do and you're the only person that does that particular thing. So you kind of represent the whole discipline in a, in a sense to the company. It also means that we're very collaborative, very interdisciplinary in terms of a design team um, and we, when we move across verticals, so from healthcare to financial services to a restaurant or something like that, we have to bring those learnings across, both through the disciplines and across the different projects. And that's brought to bear on, on, on each project. So the example here is something, this is our sneaker project. This is the, the Reebok pump, which some of you may remember, um, uh, especially if you're a Celtics fan. Um, you know, the Reebok pump actually came to life because we were doing, and we do a lot of work in the health and medical sort of med tech space. We had a project that had just wrapped on a blood pressure cuff, and then we had a new project for, uh, for Reebok about what, what can we do for athletic footwear that will be different so we can compete with a Nike Air Force One, because that was the dominant player right, right now in the, in the field. And there was a perception that basketball players were attracted to the Air Force One because it had, if you might, you might not know the shoe, it has like a Velcro piece at the top that wraps around the ankle. So when we were talking to consumers, now these consumers are high school kids about what they care about, because really that's who you want to connect with when you're selling basketball shoes. What do they care about? It's all about staying in the game. 
So how can you make a basketball shoe that can keep kids in the game? Without, so basically, it's how can you prevent them from twisting their ankle? And right away, we're able, able to leverage our understanding about blood pressure cuff technology, air bladders, and incorporate that into a shoe. And it's that sort of chocolate and peanut butter moment that you just dream about. And frankly, doesn't happen every day. It's one of these sort of feature projects. But you can take those learnings and apply them from project to project across verticals. And we're designing for people and businesses. So this is something that I think there's greater appreciation for now than there was 10 years ago. When I first started in the innovation industry, this was not that well articulated. In fact, I would say that um, when I started, this is about 2005, coming out of the architecture world, there was uh, what you would see in the innovation industry are VPs of major corporations. Um, okay, I'm not going to name them. VPs of major corporations with $5 million to spend on research a year, and they go around to the innovation firms and they just fund projects. And frankly, it didn't matter to them so much that that led to tangible benefits for the company. What they were really looking for in many cases was a way to move up and get a promotion and, and uh, just continue their career. Um, that's no longer the case. What we are seeing now is a much more, much more greater, much greater sensitivity in the spend in design and innovation and what that's going to mean in terms of tangible, bene tangible benefits for the, for, the, uh, for the company. And I think there's also much more passion related to the work. So the kind of connection between our core client teams now to the actual work is much, much greater. That kind of intellectual investment, both for us and for the design team. So we really do partner with businesses to deeply understand what they need and how to connect that with their consumers' needs. And we, in the end of the day, we try to create experiences that people love. So this is just a shot of a few things that we've done. We work in a host of different spaces, and it's really too broad to even talk about. But the work that we've done for Swiffer, which really, you know, it, it basically, um, in understanding that people care about cleaning their house, they just don't like cleaning cleaning products, right? So everybody wants a clean floor. They just don't want to have to clean the mop and the bucket and all the stuff that they use to clean their house, right? So can you create a project in a kind of lighthouse scenario that can satisfy both of those needs? And, and hence you have the Swiffer. And the, you know, the prototype, when we're talking about prototyping, the prototype for this was a, a diaper on a broom handle. That was the first prototype of the Swiffer. Like, can you create something that's disposable, like a disposable diaper, you know, that allows me to clean the floor and you have very relatively good adhesion of dirt and, and moisture to that surface and throw it out. And, you know, after a lot of prototyping, clearly the product doesn't actually look like a diaper on a broom handle, but after a lot of prototyping and science that went into the actual towelette, um, you come up with a Swiffer. Um, the work that we've done for Pampers for P&G, um, the upper right there is the Omnipod for Insulate. So um, this is the world's first um, insulin pump for, it's a wire, first world's first wireless insulin pump for type 1 diabetes. So this is a real game changer for kids. Um, the, the metrics we've got recently from consumers is that there's over 90% of consumers would never go back to the previous solution, which was a, a pump with a couple of tubes and a port. And it just, well, the, the problem is when you have something like this on your side of your body, especially when you're a kid, you just look sick, right? And so how, this, the great thing about the Omnipod is it's completely discreet. You have a wireless controller. I can check my, my um, insulin level. I can dose myself remotely, and you don't even see this thing. So you put it on some fatty tissue. For me, that's here. But, you know, this is mostly for kids, and it allows kids to kind of stay in the game. They can swim with their friends. They can be in a rock band. They can do lots of things that they wouldn't have otherwise been able to do. Um, so in terms of a great experience that changes people's lives, I think that's an amazing example. Uh, and it's a project that we took from a napkin sketch and three guys, um, and that's now a multi-hundred million dollar a year company. So in terms of the, the scale of growth, it's really incredible. And then this project I'd love for Captain D's. I love presenting this in a place like New England because nobody knows this up here, but it's basically a, a, a chain that sells um, fried fish predominantly in the Sun Belt. So you know, from the Carolinas kind of over to Oklahoma, they have 900 restaurants. So it's actually a really big chain down there. You'd know it if you lived down there. Um, and they, the cool thing about this is they bring fresh fish into the restaurant every single day. And they, and they fry it 
but they bring it fresh every single day. And the amazing thing when we, when we, we talked to this, I don't have to show pictures of this, when we, we went in and we looked at this, we didn't even have to talk to customers. Just going in and seeing the way that they were doing their business, we were like, you're not getting any credit for the fact that you have fresh fish. The last thing I would have imagined is that you're selling fresh fish in this restaurant. How come you haven't told anybody this? And yet they have, so you know, we redesigned the whole customer ecosystem to really leverage that and to make kind of fresh fish the hero of the experience. It's sometimes it's very little things, but if you don't get inside and you don't see that, you can't reveal that to the consumers and, 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 and redefine the experience. So just want to step back a second and talk about how we filled the, the mythology, the, the, the gap between the product and everything else that was filled by a lot of mythology in the Nike ecosystem. We're replacing that with actual experience, a much richer um, and I think uh, more powerful and more easy to monetize um, set of experiences. So when you look at what Nike Plus is doing for Nike, it's, it, it can leverage that in so many different ways in their experience through social media, through other product launches, through um, partnerships with other companies. I, I'm sure that, I think they've, uh, if I understand right, they've discontinued fuel band in anticipation of the iWatch. So there's so much happening with this flushing out of the customer experience, building way beyond mythology. They don't have to fake it anymore. Consumers are living it for them. So, Really where I want to want to position this is that I think the Nike shoes and I think all products, if you look at that X times 100, so there's very small things and there are very large things. Small things are products, the, the classic, when we think about the history of Continuum, 30 years ago, we started as a company that made products, product design company. We, products would be, you'd make 100,000, you'd make a million. If you're lucky, you make a billion, like the Swiffer. That's um, amazing, it's a breakthrough. Um, but oftentimes you're, you're trying to focus all of your energy on making one thing that would be reproduced, let's say a million times, 100,000 times. Slowly, you're seeing the role of design and innovation grow in scale. So in that middle range, you've got the Captain Ds. These are multi-unit customer ecosystems. A good example is hospitality, like the Holiday Inn, for example. Um, the work for Captain, Captain Ds, I think Starbucks is an amazing example where they've got 10,000 units, you can kind of amortize the investment in research and, and design innovation over those mul multiple thousands of units to create a consistent um, customer experience. The big difference here is that when you're making a shoe, um, it's a relatively simple product to deliver. But we're trying to serve a plate of food, so I'm working with a um, Chili's, a major restaurant chain and casual dining. Um, when you're trying to deliver the same recipe on a plate of food in 1,600 restaurants around the world, it's an incredibly complex customer ecosystem, but also back of house challenge. So the kind of forces that you need to bring to bear to create that consistency are just enormous. And, and, and you know, I think we've done a great job in moving, and I think as a culture, as a, as a world, we've done an incredible job of trying to solve those kind of challenges, which are much more complex than just building a pair of shoes. At the same time, I think things are going even further in scale. And so now we're dealing with college campuses, we're dealing with cities, so innovation around, um, uh, I think we're doing a lot of work on Innovation Center for corporations and for uh, nonprofit organizations. We're doing a lot of work now with um, the World Bank and how do you create systems to, to deliver um, uh, financial services at massive scale. So the scale is increasing in the, in the scale and the complexity of that design and innovation is challenging. So I think the work that you know, Fidelity is doing, I think the work that you're doing in the pharmaceutical space is an example of this increase in scale of design and innovation. It's, it's something that we're all facing together. Our challenges are becoming much more complex uh, and we're wrangling these. And so if you think of that spectrum again, you've got Pampers maybe on that product scale. If you get this right and if you can get Pampers right, um, and this is a product, project that we did about 10 years ago in the development of Pampers Stages. If you can get that right, you can sell a lot of diapers and you can really differentiate yourself from the market. Um, and so the work that we did here for Pampers was, was in understanding um, and going out and talking to consumers about what they care about. And what they, what they didn't care about, as it turns out, is how much blue liquid will fit into the diaper. 
right? And you probably all remember those commercials where it's like Huggies and Pampers and pour the blue. You know, there's parody in that technology, the diapering technology. What people really cared about is the fact that their kid could sleep through the night. Um, the fact that they, they, they start crawling. Wow. You know, like that kind of stuff that that's what people cared about. That's what they wanted to talk about. If you can connect diapering to the consumer need around child development, you can really move, move some diapers. Um, and to the point where even you, we took money off the packaging to put Elmo and Big Bird on the diaper itself because that signals child development to the consumer, to mom and dad when they're changing the diapers. So you get that product right, you can sell a whole lot of them. But then the, the ecosystem gets more challenging. So here's Holiday Inn, some work we've done on the social hub for Holiday Inn, a new lobby scenario. The challenge here is you've got um, a, a hotel experience where a lot of times the front desk would say, um, oh, breakfast? Sure. Um, yeah, there's a Starbucks down the street, or maybe you want to hit Bennigan's. Meanwhile, so they're letting all of this revenue like walk out the door every time at breakfast and sometimes in the evening too. Is there a way to capture that in a new lobby experience to keep that um, on premises? Um, and the amount of lift that we're seeing in the development of the, the social hub is incredible on the, from the food and beverage perspective. That all would have been lost revenue uh, prior to the work that we've done for them. And so you can see the scale, but delivering this service is much, much more complicated than getting Pampers on a shelf, right? And then finally, this is some work we did for the national park system um, to create a membership experience that's more about identifying and connecting to the park system and not just about use, right? So we had to change the game in creating this membership strategy around um, trying to move away from an idea that you're just going to the, to the national park, you're just gonna use the park to one where you belong to it, that you're a partner of it um, and it's your America. So really changing the game there. This is a much, much bigger system. It, loyalty programs, um, we're, again, so you can see the scale increasing. Uh, a lot of the work that we're doing around medication adherence, I think is in fact very similar to this. You're a member. So if you think of the Omnipod for Insulet, you're a member of a group of people who all use this wireless insulin device. How do you, how do you behave? That kind of creating a culture around that. It's gonna change a, a group of people together. So, so what I'm trying to do is trace this path, and I think Continuum has lived this journey, and we are continuing to live this journey. Um, and the scale is another way of referencing this, the difference between a shopping cart, which is multiple instantiations of a single design, to a complex ecosystem of a retail store, to a very complex online, offline, you name it. If you look at Staples, um, one of my clients, they're the second largest internet retailer. Most people don't know that. They are absolutely crushing it but they started as a bricks and mortar store. And yet they're still this, they're the second largest internet retailer, which is a really powerful position to be in. So how can they maximize their impact right now and really push to the future? Yes, they're, they're running neck and Amazon's number one, right? So there's a big battle there, but I think it's a really interesting place uh, to be playing. And there's some huge players out there doing it and they all need help. Um, and so this is the other axis because everybody likes a two by two. Um, so, between the size of, of, of the, the instantiation, I don't know how else to say this, the size of the artifact, if you will, um, versus the tangibility. And I think this is really what's changing now and it's changing the whole marketplace. And I think this is why you have a lot of, it, it's in many ways, um, uh, you're seeing a lot of growth in in-house innovation capabilities because of this increasing intangibility of the consumer experience, right? Things are becoming more digital, they're becoming more dynamic, um, and you can see, and I, what I think is happening is uh, with that more dynamic, more digital space, that this, this half of the two by two is going to be the place where a lot of our effort is spent in the future. Making products, and for the reasons that we talked about in rapid prototyping, you can make products much more successfully. You can do a lot of testing in-house. In you may not need to come to a consultancy as much, but now if you want to create one of these complex ecosystems, I think if you want to create a university, if you want to create a city, if you want to create um, a really robust customer experience through a lot of different verticals, you need outside help and it's really going to happen on this half. And, and the interesting thing for me as an architect is when there is some physical tangibility to it. So um, we're doing a lot of work in, come back to this, we're doing a lot of work right now in insurance. So, you know, if 
all of you have insurance of some form or another. Um, my greatest touch point with insurance is, well, there's two. One is a bill, right? Everybody loves that. And the other thing is probably a numeric code, some kind of membership number that represents who I am. That's my only connection to insurance unless something really bad happens, right? You, you never, unless something's bad happened to you recently, unfortunately, um, hopefully that hasn't happened. You haven't thought about insurance, you haven't dealt with it, you haven't interacted it, with it whatsoever until that crisis point when you have to. And then there's a whole lot of other stuff that comes into play. So we're doing a lot of design around what happens when you actually need insurance, right? which it, it's, it's not sexy stuff, but it's really, really important. But I think it's, it's, it speaks to the importance of, of playing in this space and trying to make the tangible intangible and the intangible tangible. And it's that overlap that I think is really exciting for us. So, so this is a model that we, and, and I think when we talk about the history of Continuum, starting as a product design company and our evolution over the last 30 years, we've been becoming increasingly a service design company, which I think most of you are aware of this. I think um, Nathan's diagram um, showed those two. I think your Hugh, Hugh Dubberly diagram showed the move from product to service, right? So we have gone on that journey, we're moving. And this is a diagram that we'd like to, sh to show um, that really articulates our approach to service design, which yes, understand the consumer experience. Um, and we're, we know we do a great job of that. Um, and we try to identify the unmet needs of consumers, what really is driving them. Then we also try to understand the back of the house and what, is, um, what are the, the, the different levers that you can pull uh, to change the customer experience. And usually we're looking at that solely focused on how do we affect change to the customer experience. And then to do that, oftentimes there's a bunch of touch points in the middle that you can modify. Usually it's a, 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 a multi-touch point ex experience. You've heard the term omni-channel. An omni-channel experience that brings all this stuff together and you wrap it up into a brand. I think when you think about um, what we face as a design and consulting firm, um, most of our leading clients have figured out the yellow part. Everybody's got a level of sophistication around the consumer. Um, we all go out, we talk to them, we can do ethnography, we can, we can start to understand the unmet needs of consumers pretty well. I think a lot of the tools are out there. You still, they st there's a lot of companies that still need help, and so yes, we're still in business, which is great. Um, and I think we're probably better, faster, and a little more nimble um, than a lot of other people, but the truth is, people have figured out how to start to address consumers. There's a high level of sophistication out there, which is fantastic. There's not a very high level of sophistication about how to figure out the back of house um, and how to innovate in that space. And I think this is really exciting. I think the companies that are doing internal innovation programs are trying to come at this from both directions. So everybody on that last panel is trying to attack this from both ends, which is fantastic. No, very few companies are doing it fast enough for their own liking. Everybody wants to go faster. And so there's still a lot of room for us to play. But I think when we talk about what's happening in the back of the house, that's an amazing opportunity for consultancies like mine. So I'm just saying like, hey, there's a big business out here. Um, and you can imagine where that is going to go. So I'm going to talk about one example. This is my, my one case study. And how am I doing for time? Good. Um, my one kind of case study as provocation. So we were looking at this data point, um, so according to Forrester, 89% of consumers that experience poor customer service will leave for the competition, 89%. Now, I don't know really where that comes from, but that's a stagger. I mean, I know it's Forrester, so I trust it, and I don't exactly know what they mean, but we just started thinking, so what are all the things that are connected to customer experience that we don't feel like we control, that the customer feels like they're powerless to control? And the first thing, and it, this is um, a little while ago, and it, you all know the story about the Comcast customer service call, which was a complete nightmare. Um, we think that the, the call center, or what the industry calls contact centers, are really the next frontier in, in consumer experience because so much of the, the work that, the interactions that we have with companies, because of the example of insurance that I mentioned, right, where you don't really have to interact with it, you don't even think about it until a crisis happens, and then you're like, well, insurance, there's no storefront for insurance. There's no retail store. I'm going to go to a call. I got to call somebody. 
that interaction is so, so critical and it's becoming more critical all the time. So we want to take a look at this. And we tried to learn from the industry leaders. So Zappos, amazing customer experience. They do a great job in their call centers. Providing great customer experience is not only core to what they are, it's really the foundation of the company. I mean, the fact that they sell stuff is just almost accidental. They just love to help people. Um, and so, and you can see it when you, you, you like their front desk at their headquarters is like a big Zappos box. I mean, it's goofy, but it also says something about who they are. It's, it, it's silly in an, in a, a, an important in a, in a telling way and, and the kind of culture they create. Um, you know, so, you know, Zappos amazing. They do an amazing job. They really are living this life of the customer experience. Now you can call them and we did this as part of our research. You can call them and they'll stay on the phone with you forever. You can have a two hour conversation with a Zappos employee on the phone. No problem. In fact, they will wear you out because they're so nice. You can't even make up stuff to riff that long. Like they'll, they're just absolutely great. They just want to make you feel good. They want to solve your problems. Hey, how you doing? Fantastic. So I can't show you, we're doing a few projects in the call center space that I can't actually share with you. This is a white paper project that we did with a, a client. We're doing some, a couple of other things with them. Um, so I can share this with you. We've done a lot of research and understand the difference be, differences between call centers to try to make this better. And uh, it leads to a few provocations for you. So the first is the difference between inbound and outbound. And what, one of the things we learned is there's a million different flavors of call centers. So those of you in the business world are way ahead of me on this. But um, you've got callers that are, are outbound, they're trying to sell stuff, they just want to like ping you, they don't really care too much about the interaction or who you are, they're just trying to get your attention and try to sell you something. Then you have all the inbound calls, these are really customer service calls. People are like, I need something, my thing isn't working, I'm sick, I fell. And there's an incredible differentiation in the level of acuity of those calls. Some of them are, my damn thing doesn't work, and other things are, I'm, I'm not well, I'm having heart palpitations. Um, and so this is a, a company that actually deals with those kind of calls, high acuity calls. And yet, does that look like the kind of place where you'd want to have your high acuity call taken from? You know, does, does that evoke the kind of um, level of expertise that you would imagine that you'd want to have on the other end of that phone? You know, so you have some like highly trained you have physicians, you have highly trained people, people that have big salaries that are taking calls in that kind of context, right? So what does that communicate to those people that are spending their lives um, serving those clients? I just wanna keep that in your head. Um, these agents are super resilient. They will, they get moved from place to place. So in some cases they have a, their own desk, but in other cases they, they're doing, they're running three shifts, they move in, today they're sitting over there, tomorrow they're sitting over there. They've got calls that just kind of ping in all the time. They've got a feed. They can track them. Um, they're, they also know that they're constantly being monitored on their performance. Um, and, and, and yet they're incredibly resilient. And, they're, and most of the time they're in really great spirits. So please, when you have a, an interaction with a call center person, like realize like what they're going through on the other end is, is often really, really tough. And yet they do an amazing job. Um, and so when we're talking about being monitored this is what happens to these people. So, you know, this is uh, a chart which says, you know, what percentage of calls were successful that day? Did, did they process related to their goal? So they're doing pretty well, right? But they know that there's a kind of, it affects them. They know they're constantly being monitored. It changes their behavior. It changes their performance. You don't have this at Zappos. The interesting thing about this example is they tried to make this a digital system. It didn't work. People need that feeling that for it to actually work, you need somebody to go over to the sign and draw a 100 or a 97 on the chart for it to really register to people that this is a, a real process. And, it's, and it, it's, a, it's, it's that kind of tangibility of that that's really important. And then the work environment. So you see all the affordances that people are making to their work environment. It's a regular a cubicle. You see the sweater on the back of the desk, the modification of the chair. Now that chair costs $1,100 at retail, and yet you see all the, you know, that's an Aeron chair. <laughs> we do work for Herman Miller, so it's okay. Um, you know, but all the other affordances that are made to, to kind of make it their own. Um, there's a heater underneath the desk, and then you've got all the Yankee stuff, um, on the, which, you know, we don't have to talk about so much. But to, just to make, 
just to make it their own home, right? In the pictures of their kids and their dogs and their cats and stuff like that. Um, and so the modification of the space, but yet like you're kind of just asking people to, to reskin a, a cubicle. So is that really the work environment that you want a high acuity specialist working in when they're dealing with your, when, you know, if your mother falls, is this the context that you want her to be calling into when she's sick or she's hurt? No, you want, you imagine, what you imagine is like the, the go team. It's like, it's NASA. It's like, you know, a bunch of people like around computers, like trying to figure this out, not this kind of environment. And, and I think the longer this circumstance stays the way that this is, we're gonna have a real crisis in, in customer experience because I think we're gonna start sniffing this out. You're gonna start seeing YouTube videos of people at their call centers saying, this is what my work environment is like. This is gonna come out. We all have to get ahead of this. And I think a lot of companies are starting to do that now. So these are a few provocations. I don't have solutions. These are provocations. And, and these are just ways that we think. So we often do illustrations to communicate our ideas. Sometimes they're goofy and oftentimes that kind of cuts to the point a little bit uh, quicker. Um, this is really about un re understanding um, the difference in distribution and scale. So now with the new technologies, you can have very tiny call centers. You can have a call center of one in somebody's home. So understanding that you can distribute customer experience into a variety of different places is really important. Um, so in the financial services uh, world, if you're doing retail banking, you can have a call center in the back of your small branch in Belmont. That's something that you can actually do now that you couldn't do previously. You need to rethink about distribution and scale as it pertains to your customer experience because sometimes that matters. Sometimes it matters that when I call into a call center, it's somebody from my neighborhood. So if I could put a call center in my neighborhood, that's a valuable thing. You have to rethink that. Improve human uh, ergonomics. So this is a no after what I've shown you, this should be a no-brainer for you, but we really need to rethink the model of having a cubicle farm as the as the the way that we distribute space for for any, well any human being frankly but particularly in a call center environment where oftentimes it's creating a more collaborative environment between the call center people is useful i mean you hear the other ones on the phone right you call into a call center or you have somebody call you you can hear every other operator you think within 30 feet yet they're all working in cubicle land so can we rethink the way that this works to create a more collaborative environment that we think will be more productive for consumers? Um, elevate the role of the agent. So this, this, seem, this seems obvious. You know, right now, it's all based on metrics and little awards. So when you, I don't know if we should have this photograph of all the little trophies that the call center people get. Well, you know, that's really not elevating the, their role. This, they are frontline employees. They are as important as the person who's at the front door of Nordstrom, I think that you were talking about that, you know, those people are highly trained. If you go to Ritz-Carlton, the way that they've modeled their entire customer experience, you need to elevate the role of the call center people to that of the people in a Ritz-Carlton. That's what needs to happen in the future. And I think there's an awareness that that, that, that is coming. And, and the reason why you wanna do that um, is so you can personalize the recognition to a certain degree, so you can be, create meaningful, if you're gonna recognize people, have it be meaningful to them. Don't create a bunch of trophies and, and, and uh, you know, loyalty points on, a, on something. Give them something that matters to them. Help them advance their career. Because we need to ultimately develop a career path for these people. And what we've seen in the industry is that call center people are not factored in to the kind of um, talent pool of a corporation. They're kind of on the periphery. And, and that's why you see so much outsourcing of call centers. These guys can be any old people. Well, I think the truth is we have to rethink that and think of these, the call center as a, the stepping or one of the key steps on a growth trajectory for the future leaders of our business. If we don't think this way, I think we're going to leave out a huge piece of our talent pool in the future. So this is looking at one thing that I think is uh, on the spectrum of tangible to intangible, very large part of a customer ecosystem. If you think about this with every other part of a back of house, of a customer ecosystem, it becomes an inc incredibly robust and sophisticated um, challenge. Uh, and, and, and I think we need to not just think about the customer experience, that kind of part on that, the yellow part on the left, but also the pink part or the orange part, I guess it was, 
on the right, which is what is the employee experience? How do those two things come together to really create the services of the future? And I think in doing that, we're gonna further enrich that space that was left for Nike mythology in the past. That's gonna be a much, much richer customer experience and also experience for all of us. So um, that's where I think Continuum is heading. Um, and I think you will, when we come back here 30 years from now to talk about what we've done in the past, it'll be a lot more of that kind of work. Um, not so much on the product side, but in the much more complex ecosystem end of the spectrum. So um, brand mythology is being replaced by the lived experiences of people. Um, and this is a rapidly emerging growth area for human understanding and for design intervention. So that bottom part is really important to me because we are experts at human understanding and design intervention, and we can bring that to bear on this, what I think is this kind of expanding world um, that, uh, that we're all living. So um, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And uh, I'd love to take some questions if there's still time. Yeah. So. Hi, it was a nice presentation, and I totally agree with you in terms of the call center is a front line. Um, having had really bad experience with call centers. Who hasn't? Right. Yeah. But I think the other thing, in addition to what you were saying, is that you know you had talked about these um, highly intelligent, well-paid people in terms of, like, say, an emergency call center where you know they're trained professionals. But I think a lot of times, in terms of other call centers for other companies, they're not in terms of paid. Um, or I should say, um, you know, they're more in terms of a lower level. And I think that is the issue because when they're at a lower level, there's really no incentive in terms of, you know, giving the best service. So if you take in terms of, say, your salespeople who are, you know, highly paid and make the incentive in terms of them being in the front line, because they are the front line people, but translate that into the call center people, I think that's where they're going to get good experience. So I just wanted to say that comment. But the other comment that I, um, or question I should say, that was a comment. The question I wanted to ask is, you know, you talk about in terms of um, sort of like the customer experience and now the movement in terms of at least in the marketing realm, particularly in e-commerce, is more personalized in terms of customer service. And in fact, even the healthcare is talking about personalized medicine. So I'm curious in terms of how you as your company are kind of going to address it because now it becomes not just times one, but it's a fraction of that because now you're trying to do a custom, customized experience, particularly, in, you know, like on mobile and everything that's connected to e-commerce. Okay, so the, the, to the first point about um, that the call center people are on the low level, I, what I, where I don't want to be if I'm working in a company is doing a retail because I think those are the people that are actually going to be eliminated when you think about the experiences that we're having. Yet, I think these call center people are there to stay. So there's going to be a recalibration, I think, in the kind of valuation of, of what they do. And I think that's going to have ripple effects throughout the industry. I think that's where a company like Zappos is going to win because they really tanked it on. It's internal. They made heroes out of their call center people where you have other companies that just dismissed it. And the second question about personalization, um, I mean, this is a key part of everything that we're doing now. I think uh, understanding the role of CRM and, and all the different um, tools that one would use to create a more rapid personalized service um, is really important. And yet uh, you have to, it's just one piece of the puzzle. So uh, I think that the, what what's most important about this is how can you create, how can you provide that personalized information to all parts of the ecosystem at the same time. That's really the challenge that we're seeing because it's one thing to do a great, really great personalized app, but if that's only one part of your experience, so if that's the whole um, customer experience, you're, you're set, you're, you're fine. And I think there are some, there are some examples, I have to think of one, where, um, where that's the case. But even in Uber, which I think is a good example where it's it's a pretty um, minimal customer experience in some sense. You've got a, a, an app, and that does almost all of your serves all of your kind of operational functions except for the driver. And yet, I don't think Uber is doing a great job of delivering the personalized information to that driver at the time that he picks he or she picks me up. I use Uber a ton, and that person has no idea who I am when I walk in the cab, and I have no idea why that's the case. They don't know that I'm a heavy user. I use it 
five, six times a week, they should know that right away. Like now, and that, and that should not be my star ranking, right? So what I'm saying, I guess what I'm saying is like, there's got to be a greater level of sophistication in how you transmit that information across the whole customer ecosystem. And I think we're still at the infancy of figuring that out. There's a, there's a mic coming for, not, you know. Thank you. Great presentation. In regards to your challenges, uh, I wanted to figure out what you believe is more important. Is it your physical environment or is it your cultural environment? So you might have a great you know, facility, but if you're there in a toxic environment, I mean, is that good? Or? No, it, it depends on you, who, you, who you are as an organization and a culture. I think for some cultures, space matters. Um, for others, it's going to be recognition, building teams. Um, uh, I would say, either, using the example of Zappos, they've done a great job of creating coaches. So one of the, the kind of best job you can have at Zappos, I'm told, is to be a coach who can then lead a bunch of people. And that, that's a really privileged position. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to change. It's going to vary for different companies. What these provocations are meant to do is be a probe, throw it out there, get you thinking about what matters to you, and then you come back to a company like me and ask me to solve it. So uh, maybe we can have that conversation after. So I've just learned that Continuum doesn't research. So for your clients, how can you help your clients um, identify the unmet needs of the customers? So we, we do do research. I, maybe I missed it. Okay, you do. We, I mean, we, we learn, but we, we do. We do. <laughs> we're, you know, we're, uh, uh, splitting so hairs. do you use but, social media to... Have There's a lot of different tools. Between. So we do, uh, um, all of our work is based on, um, we do a lot of uh, consumer ethnography. So these are deep multi-hour interviews with consumers to really understand what they care about. And, and those interviews start with, you know, talking to them about their families and their kids and their jobs. Um, and then slowly going into deeper and deeper probing on the task at hand, whether that's financial services or food. Uh, the food project that I referenced earlier, we went and did a two-hour home interview. We looked in people's refrigerators. We looked in their pantry. We went to dinner with them. We saw how um, a family of five went out to dinner at a, at a restaurant, and mom had three bites of her meal and put the rest in a doggy bag because she was spending too much time wrangling her family. So my, my point is we do deep ethnography of people to understand what they care about. Um, Yet there are many other techniques that you can use. Social media is being used a lot for doing research now. Um, we're often coaching our clients on how to do research better internally um, and kind of shepherd them into a deeper understanding about how to do design thinking and design research. Um, I have a question with regard to what you just uh, spoke of, which is the role of someone working for Continuum in doing that learning. Um, and the question is, what kind of education would prepare the best kind of employee for Continuum in this future scenario? What should we be doing yeah. in preparing people for that kind of work? Well, I know that I know it's true um, for my, my boss, John Franco Zakai, the founder, that seeing the consumer experience firsthand changed his life. It changed my life. Um, what do you need to do that? Um, I really think you need to be a, a good listener. That's the number one thing. I, I, what I see a lot and the thing that I have to train people specifically, especially when we take our clients out in the field. So I've taken CEOs and things like that out to meet customers. And you have to coach them to just listen. That you're not going to solve the world's problems. You're not going to answer big questions in the moment, in that conversation, you just have to listen. And so a lot of it is how do you nod your head while people are talking and not talk over them. I think um, the other thing that um, is a skill that is useful is being able to recognize patterns, ultimately, because you, you, you we're not going to design a project, uh, design a product or a service based on my conversation with you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna design a project, a uh, product or service by my understanding of a lot of people that are a lot like you 
and being able to kind of create a pattern successfully of that, that, that really connects to that and then be able to link that to the customer segmentation that our client has done, usually on the marketing side, is really important. And that's a lot of pattern recognition and formation that's often done in real time and is super in, seemingly intuitive. But it's, it's those two skills that I think are most important, pattern recognition and kind of active listening. Yeah. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you.